to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. When most people outside of the peptide and hormone optimization community hear the term HCG, I'm talking about those normal people, not like you and me, what typically comes to mind is the hormone characteristic of pregnancy. HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, is what pregnancy tests recognize, and there are values that indicate what is expected in a normal pregnancy versus what would represent unfortunate outcomes. And it's also a valuable tool in assessing presence of certain types of cancers, and apparently is also used to treat freaking nymphomania in cows due to cystic ovaries. And in the body, HCG is a glycoprotein similarly shaped to certain pituitary hormones, and its beta subunit actually closely resembles that of luteinizing hormone, or LH, which becomes a bit more important later in our discussion. And interestingly, although predominantly secreted by the syncytiotrophoblastic cells during pregnancy, HCG is also shown to be secreted by the pituitary in settings of high LH, or luteinizing hormone production. And although the purpose of this video is quite obviously not pregnancy, I'll briefly share that the role of HCG is multifarious, and it remarkably leads to secretion of progesterone, from the corpus luteum, which therein promotes maintenance of the endometrial lining, essentially allowing for growth and survival of the embryo. And although the corpus luteum eventually dissipates, the role is overtaken by the placenta, which feeds the baby nutrients, oxygen, and serves to remove waste. Pretty amazing stuff, but I digress. Anabolics users and those who are hypogonadal or infertile frequently turn, oftentimes by prescription, to injecting this compound that is actually synthesized from the physiology of pregnancy itself. And although there's something comedically ironic about a superphysiologic roided out maniac injecting a vital component of pregnancy, all jokes aside, there is certainly merit in doing so. And interestingly, if we take a look at the compounding info for Pregnol, a form or brand of HCG produced by New Era Pharmacy, it's sourced from the urine of pregnant women, and that's actually what you'd expect. Now that we got the less relevant but ever so interesting material out of the way. This is my regular video request that if you like this sort of content, hammer that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you hate it, public outcry if you must. If people ask what's the best way to help a small peptide YouTuber out, a like and a sub go a very long way. Thank you. And if you are enjoying this video, make sure to stay until the end where we'll discuss dosing frequency and the importance of staying on track in conjunction with a medical professional because there are some possible design flaws that could really influence the outcomes here. Now, when men are on TRT or testosterone replacement therapy, as we've all heard of by now, there are a few perceived notable reasons about why they may supplement with HCG. One is to increase spermatogenesis, as evidenced by what men refer to as having, quote, bigger balls, unquote, maintenance of fertility, and in some cases, although not recommended by the testosterone optimization community, as an isotherapy for increasing testosterone. And by isotherapy, I mean it's the only thing you take. And this is because it's popularly known as an LH or luteinizing hormone mimetic, something that would act like luteinizing hormone does itself, because as we discussed earlier, structurally at least, HCG does resemble its similarly shaped glycoprotein friend, luteinizing hormone. And if you remember my previous video on TRT and growth hormone peptides, which I highly recommend you check out, self-plug, LH is responsible for lytic cell production of testosterone. And since these two molecules essentially share a receptor, and the receptor itself is even named for both compounds. The LHCGR stands for Luteinizing Hormone Chorion Gonadotropin Receptor. That's why you'll see that recombinant HCG is used in treatment of infertility in hypogonadal men, and is oftentimes uptitrated in a way that testosterone levels are at a desirable point. And during this period of dose adjustment, doctors will take a look at sperm concentrations to see if this treatment is working and helping these hypogonadal men reproduce. And interestingly, when it was looked at in hypogonadal men who weren't on HCG for infertility concerns, it did show to alleviate symptoms in a way that TRT would in a low testosterone male. 
with regards to body composition, improvement in lipid profile, and bone formation. And when it was looked at in older men, it certainly raised testosterone, lowered FSH, and LH, which would be expected, didn't really seem to impact strength, but did have surprise decreased testicular volume. And I'm tempted to make a joke about if it was due to these males an uh, increase in libido that may have predisposed them to take certain matters into their own hands, but I can't say for sure. In all seriousness, though, this was probably because of negative feedback, decreasing FSH, thereby inhibiting spermatogenesis, which would, in theory, decrease testicle size. And given it's an LH mimetic, eventual suppression of endogenous testosterone production via negative feedback to the hypothalamus and possible desensitization of the Leydig cells through increased binding at the LHCG receptor which is plausible based on our current understanding. Regardless, for decades at this point, gonadotropin replacement has been looked at as a possible treatment to infertility, and it's still in the works. And quite clearly, and popularly, it's not the same as injecting exogenous testosterone for a lot of the aesthetic and performative benefits that people seek. However, when it comes to an attempt to restore fertility, in many cases, it's not the end-all be-all. However, in contrast to testosterone administration in a hypogonadal individual, it's got potential because as many people have heard by now, and as we discussed in the other day's video, exogenously administered testosterone can very well, at least temporarily, inhibit the functions of fertility. We're taking exogenous testosterone, which nullifies our testes' own production, thereby inducing negative feedback on the pituitary, decreasing FSH and LH, which would inhibit our own production as a result. Or in other words, we're injecting the end product of the pathway that takes GnRH to testosterone, and so negative feedback prevents not only our own production of T, but the precursor hormones that would contribute to spermatogenesis. It's why testicular atrophy is such a common side effect of TRT, and why Oftentimes, people's biggest concern is infertility, and so they turn to HCG. And by the way, let me know if you do like this video, because then I can make another one about HMG. I think it would be a cool topic to dive into if you do find this interesting. And so it's been thought that hypogonadism serves as a metabolic risk factor, and it's becoming more and more popular of an idea the more research that comes about with regards to low testosterone and hormone optimization within this space. But this pretty much means that having hypogonadism or being hypogonadal would correlate to factors that contribute to development of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and perhaps even management with gonadotropin compounds would benefit people in improving these risks, similar to how TRT may in a hypogonadal person as well. And one study in particular looked at people with hypogonadism and saw that they showed improvements in their insulin resistance, i.e. became more insulin sensitive, presumably due to increases in testosterone, which should, as Derek from More Plates more dates says frequently, produce a more metabolically active environment, in the sense that there would be increased glucose uptake by muscles and quite likely through reducing adiposity, i.e. fat loss. And there was a study that evaluated TRT in combination with HCG therapy in eugonadal males, so in people where FSH, LH, and testosterone were within normal range. So these men were started on exogenous testosterone, or TRT, and their intratesticular testosterone, or their ITT, was measured. And this is quite literally the testosterone inside the testicle, which was obtained with fine needle aspiration, which doesn't sound too comfortable. So the groups in the study were 200 mg testosterone with different concentrations of HCG. So there was a saline placebo group, 125 IUs, 250 IUs, and 500 IUs, and it was administered every other day for three weeks. Caveat here is that there were only 29 males enrolled in the trial, albeit they were all able to participate and didn't really develop any significant adverse effects. So in the placebo group, intratesticular testosterone was suppressed by 94%, which makes sense given the group was purely on exogenous testosterone without HCG. But what was noticed was that with increasing dose of HCG came a linear increase in presence of intratesticular testosterone, so much so that the 500 IU every other day group was 26% greater than actual baseline. 
And although the relationship between intratestacular testosterone and spermatogenesis isn't quite known or 100% known, the idea is that by achieving normalcy of ITT, it would be more likely to provoke normal spermatogenesis, production of sperm, which of course is crucial for fertility purposes. We know that ITT is crucial for spermatogenesis, and we have a good sense that a higher ITT than serum testosterone is required for normal spermatogenesis. So in a nutshell, exogenous testosterone significantly decreases ITT, which is thought to be a factor leading to infertility, and we know that HCG has the ability to increase this number to above baseline. So although research does not show it's necessary for anybody on exogenous testosterone who can tolerate it, it's likely one of the better things you can do in maintaining fertility besides not being on TRT if you're eugonadal and have appropriate spermatogenesis, but I'm not here to make people's choices for them just to teach. And this is what interests eugonadal individuals, particularly anabolic users, the most. Given that one exogenous testosterone essentially shuts down our own fertility, this is a method by which it's quite possible to provide restorative effects to intratesticular testosterone production and spermatogenesis. As such, it's been used in management of this condition also known as steroid-induced hypogonadism. And on top of that, in subfertile men, it's been shown there is a decent chance that HCG administration can actually improve sperm quality itself, via metrics like motility and morphology, which supports the recommendation for TRT users or steroid blasters to administer HCG to decrease chances of permanent infertility while maximizing an attempt at maintaining fertility. Alright, so as my regular viewers know, I typically don't reference dose in my videos on experimental peptides because there's such limited data on them and I take the YouTube medical advice disclaimer seriously, so unless I can contribute a theorized educational plan that would maximize safety and address the biggest concerns, something not typically addressed, I find myself shying away from commenting on it. And I feel like that's responsible rather than saying definitely take it at this dose to definitely achieve this effect when that teeters more on bro science more often than not than, you know, the legit data, that boring stuff I spend countless hours sifting through. And in this case, I do feel it's responsible to highlight a component of crafting a dosing protocol, particularly with regards to length of administration, duration. Because it seems like it's worth highlighting that Although it's likely the case that not all doses of HCG are created equal, it's more important that not all dosing regimens are created equal as well, in the sense that gonadal response and lack thereof is likely influenced by duration of use. By this I mean that the longer the product is used, the more likely the individual will develop hormonal suppression. Kind of like in that study we addressed where the participants lost testicular volume, this is likely because it took place over three months, and this is quite possible possibly a range of time long enough to negatively feed back on the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Let's think about it. HCG binds the LHCG receptor, which in turn stimulates the lydic cells to produce testosterone. The increase in testosterone combined with the long half-life of exogenous HCG would create a physiologic environment in which the increased testosterone would essentially tell the pituitary to decrease production of FSH and LH. There would ultimately be decreased need for endogenous production as well as decreased sensitivity to exogenous HCG administration, which means pretty much that the point of diminishing returns has been met. Now the impact of this would be that it doesn't just prolong the return of normal testicular function in an otherwise healthy person, but also that as stated, the point at which its maximum efficacy is reached is now at a point in the past. In males with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, this becomes less relevant, but it does become more important, particularly in males either slowing down their TRT or steroids in an attempt to get pregnant, or in people who are on HCG isotherapy, who opted to use HCG alone to increase levels of testosterone or whatever perceived effects they hope to seek. That's why if you look up recommendations for management of steroid-induced hypogonadism in people trying to conceive, you'll see that some researchers feel cessation of exogenous testosterone plus HCG plus clomid or clomiphene in a serum would be a good first-line treatment, and to consider addition of FSH later in the process pending efficacy and lab results. Now, this clomid or clomiphene, it's used because as a serum, it can help restore pituitary function by stimulating release of 
of GnRH at the level of the hypothalamus and downstream release of LH and FSH. The subtleties in the process and individual variabilities are why medical professionals should be consulted in somebody who has been on exogenous androgens trying to conceive. From a clinical standpoint, yes, there may be some stigma, but it hopefully isn't embarrassing, and it really shouldn't be, and oftentimes it does require changes and titrations of different compounds involved, not to mention the individual variability in that restorative properties of HCG do in fact depend on the person's age and duration of testosterone use, age more so than length of tea administration. There's really no research indicating exactly how long a certain aged individual on HCG plus or minus Clomid will achieve normal spermatogenesis, and so I'm not going to make any prediction on that because honestly I really can't, nor will I craft a precise dosing regimen given the consistent presence of this variability, but I will strongly encourage you to consider these important factors and hopefully elevate yourself over this stigma and consult a medical professional if this topic is of concern to you. Now of course, although we can expect a similar adverse effect profile or similar concerns as we can with testosterone administration with exogenous HCG from injection site irritation to mood changes, in a large enough dose it's not impossible to develop even gynecomastia, acne, fluid retention, and its consequences. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Questions, concerns, hate mail, feel free to reach out. I appreciate you all as always. If you did like the video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Most importantly, have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. <laughs>